thanks. Thanks. Thanks everybody for being here. Uh, whatever the local time is. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation. So uh, th this is, uh, as the title suggests, uh, maybe a, a, it tries to be a welcoming introduction to understanding Lagrangian feelings and Legendre knots through the lens of sheaves, and in particular, the microlocal theory of sheaves. Uh, I'll, I'll try to do my best to be correct, uh, but also give some clear ideas of what's going on. But just stop me at any time if you want uh, any further details or clarifications, whether it is for experts or just somebody who's never seen these at all. All right. Well, maybe let me start by something that uh, is important to me, which is uh, we're going to be discussing Legendrian links in contact topology. I think it's true that studying Legendrian submanifolds is useful. It is useful to prove theorems. It is useful to have a better understanding of the field, both in context and symplectic topology. If you really like Lagrangian submanifolds, well, if they are exact, you can leave them to Legendrians. And if they're not exact, but maybe monotone, you can leave them to fronts that maybe don't close up, but Legendrians also appear in that setting. Um, I think Alan Weinstein famously said everything is a Lagrangian. Legendrians are very close to Lagrangian, so I, I don't dare say everything is a Legendrian, but I think if you read Arnold enough, he kind of says that. So um, let me point out that uh, on the left here, we've drawn a Legendrian front. So in the case of links, uh, in the same way that a smooth knot, a smooth link does have a diagram, yeah, the same is true for a front. Any Legendrian front, say, for instance, in the unit contention bundle of the plane, which is where we will be, does have a front diagram that describes it. And all the information in that immersed curve, possibly with simple cusps, recovers the Legendrian itself. Um, I think I mentioned here that Legendrians can be useful for things that maybe apparently you wouldn't think about um, to use Legendrians for. One of them is the detection of rep orbits, computation of floor theoretic invariants, classification of contact structures, connections to other areas. So, for instance, I, I sometimes think, you know, imagine if, if, if we were able to talk to, to Poincaré and he cared about the existence of some periodic orbit, and we told him, look, if you're able to prove that this Legendre knot has a Lagrangian filling, then the symplectic cohomology of the Foucault category is non-zero, and then you have a periodic orbit. It's somewhat mind-blowing connection uh, of how Legendrians and Lagrangians actually are able to tell you something about dynamics. For floor theoretic invariants, the DGA for Legendrians is one of the few actually computable invariants, algorithmically in the case of knots, and so on. I personally like them because they are very visible in real life uh, through caustics of light. I find them very beautiful if I go to the ocean or the swimming pool, see how light changes. Uh, so I would also just argue this is an interesting thing, period, for myself and, and just study it. I wanted to share a very brief uh, animation with you. Um, I was reading the newspaper one day and a, a Legendrian appeared and I was quite happy. So I was reading this article by the New York Times about a volcano in Tonga that exploded, and it was quite an explosion. And they made an animation, scientists in, in Islas Baleares actually made an animation. And I don't know if you can see, it's the animation of the shock wave of that volcano exploding and then going around the earth and going to the other side and back to the other side and back. Um, it's, it's a Legendrian isotopy. What you're seeing is the front of a Legendrian. And the Legendrian isotopy lasted for 72 hours. Uh, on my record, this is the largest Legendrian I've ever seen, and also the longest Legendrian isotopy sort of I've experienced in real life. <laughs> my Legendrian isotopy is the last more than a work day. Um, so uh, as, a, as a sort of side comment, the, this is of interest to, in this case, geologists and people who study seismic phenomena, uh, shockwaves and the like. Uh, if you want me to delve into that one day, I'm happy to. But again, Arnold insisted a lot in his writings how, how these things do appear in geometric optics, thermodynamics and the like. All right, so for today's talk, and here I've, I've shown you some caustics, um, 
uh, we're just going to focus on those Legendrians that are actually in the unit cotangent bundle of R2. This notation here stands for you take the plane R2, you take the cotangent bundle with its standard symplectic manifold coming from the Liouville form, and the infinity is meant to indicate that you take the uh, unit cotangent bundle if you want to fix a metric, and if you think in terms of the language that the Manuel Giro develop of ideal contact boundaries, you just take the ideal contact boundary of that domain. That is a contact manifold. You can consider Legendian links in it. That's what we're going to be focusing on. All right. So now let's start with uh, the definition in, in the Wiktionary, wiki, the Wiki Dictionary. If you, if you Google in the dictionary, what does microlocal mean? you're going to find a definition local with respect to both space and cotangent space, which is great if you know what cotangent space is. Uh, if, if a student did approach me and did not, did not know what that meant, I would, I would say, in summary, it means you want to study functions and also their first derivatives. So anything that's to do with functions and their first derivatives, that is sort of within the realm of microlocal, and then add your favorite name for that. Um, I should say that um, th these functions don't need to be smooth. Uh, they can they can be C1 and they can also be C0 sometimes and further this might or might not exist. That's also all, all being studied within microlocal. Um, if you come from the world of PDEs, microlocal really is about trying to understand how a certain maybe singular initial uh, condition propagates and those singularities propagate. Um, so microlocal is, is everything to do with first derivatives. Um, if you have seen contact and symplectic topology through the lens of generating functions, maybe that's not unreasonable that microlocal might have to do with Legendrians. If you think of Legendrians as surf diagrams of critical points of families of critical functions. So um, maybe that's something. Uh, rather, let me, let me first ask a philosophical question. You suppose you have two Legendrian isotopy classes. It, it, lambda prime could be lambda. So you just have two Legendrian knots in, in the unique tangent bundle, even R3 in a Darbu chart in there. How do they interact? And again, I want to emphasize that I did not write Legendrian links. I, I wrote Legendrian isotopy classes. We really are interested in the kind of interaction that is invariant under contact isotopy, that if you perturb one of them by Legendrian isotopy, you still can talk about this. So as a toy example, you could ask the following question, and this is not a contact topology comment. Suppose you have two subsets of the plane. So maybe you know subset number one looks like this. And subset number two uh, looks like that. Well, how do subsets or sets talk to each other? You, you can take unions or you can take intersections. Um, one way that you can take the intersection, maybe from an analytical viewpoint, is you can take the characteristic function of A. So that's a function which is zero outside of A, one in A, the same for B. And then you just take the product of those two functions. So think of, of some kind of hills, which is one here, zero everywhere else, one here, zero everywhere else. You multiply anywhere where one of them was zero, you get zero. So you end up getting something that captures the intersection. Hopefully we're comfortable with that. Microlocal theory of sheaves, when it comes to studying Legendrians, it's in a way a vast generalization of this phenomenon. So the idea now is to say, okay, I not only have a plane, I have the plane R2, that's going to be the zero section of the cotangent bundle. And in it, I have a stratification. So that's the first idea. A Legendrian has a front, it has a diagram, and it stratifies the plane for you. How does that happen? Well, the cusps and the crossings are the zero dimensional strata. The arcs like these are the one dimensional strata. And then you have pieces like that, which are the two dimensional strata. Um, are we comfortable with that? It's a stratification, and if you have nice Legendrian links, and for links this is always true in general, you can ask for sub-analytic Legendrians, you're going to have good properties for the stratification, namely things like Whitney property. So now you can say, well, let me, let me try to think of this stratification and now study functions on it. So now constructible functions on the plane, which are constructible with respect to stratification, meaning they're locally constant in each strata. 
And I started with a relatively simple one. I started with a function that was zero outside. So it's zero outside. Then I said, well, let's make it constant equal to one here in this strata, in this strata. That's what the numbers mean. That's a constant equal to one. Two in the middle open set. And then I put some numbers, little ones in red and the little twos for the crossings. Um, so that's just a function, not continuous function at all, but it's constructible with respect to the stratification. Okay, so that maybe generalizes a bit the characteristic function. And obviously the function is not unique. You, you have options and you can try to think about that a bit. And at some point, especially if you look at later 20th century, you realize that there is a good way to categorify, to sort of package constructible functions into something which is algebraically more amenable. And that is the notion of constructible sheaves. So one good thing about sheaves is that by the way they're defined, um, they almost automatically come with uh, arms between them, a way that they can talk to each other, they can interact. And the only caveat at this stage, uh, constructible, I missed a T, sorry. The only caveat in here is that when you categorify to constructible sheaves, you still have the same issue that you had with functions. Namely, you don't seem to be able to see first derivatives. Where is the microlocal business in here? So for instance, one way to categorify, uh, in meaning take a sheaf that induces this, this function is instead of at number two, maybe I put here a vector space C2. Instead of a number one, I put a C. Instead of a number here, I put a zero. So now you have a sheaf of complexes of vector spaces or just vector spaces. And when I take the Euler characteristic of every stock, that gives me a constructible function if the sheaf was constructible itself. Um, I think maybe Grotendieck or people in that school used to call this the function sheaf correspondence. Um, so the good idea, the really new thing that happened that made this constructible shift theory be able to interact with contact and symplectic uh, is to Miki Osato, very well explained and thoroughly explained by uh, Masaki Kashiwara and Pierre Shapira in their book, uh, Shifts on Manifolds, but then in many articles and conferences later. It's the notion of singular support. So that's one of the few things I won't be able to explain in detail today, but I want to at least give you a quick uh, intuition the singular support of a sheaf, it's meant to capture those points in the cotangent bundle. So here the sheaf is in R2, remember? So now we're going to take, for instance, a point here and a direction. So that's a point in the cotangent bundle. And what the microlocal support does for you, the singular support, these are equivalent words, is it measures the sections of the sheaf in a little neighborhood before and after propagating exactly in that direction. I, I, so what you do is you take right before and after and you propagate exactly in the direction that you've chosen in your cotangent point. And then you compare R gamma, you compare um, derived sections. If those derived sections before and after through the restriction map are isomorphic, then you say that the sheaf does not have a singular support there. The sheaf does not jump when you go in that direction when it comes to global sections or derived sections. And, and so that point is not in the singular support. So what you ask is that the points of the Legendrian are to be in the singular support, or rather that the singular support is included there. So for instance, in, the, in what I've drawn in here, this point in here with this direction will be in the singular support in that when I compute the sheaves before and then after in that direction, I'm going to see a change. And a, a reason for that is you have a C here and a C2, and that map over here is going to capture some change in the singular, uh, sorry, in the, in the global sections, meaning that point in the cotangent bundle, meaning that point in the plane with that direction is in the singular support. So for experts, I apologize that that's uh, as much of a cartoon picture as I'm going to depict today, but, but maybe that gives some intuition of, of why this is interesting. Um, for those who are familiar with things like the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence, I tend to think of the, the relation between sheaves and floor theory as some kind of Riemann-Hilbert, like the sheaves sort of capture the sheaf of global sections of your PDE problem, and, and that sheaf just happens to have 
you know, it's not constructible. It jumps sometimes uh, in the same way that a constructible function does jump. Are there any questions at this stage? I have a naive question. I mean, why for the purposes of the definition of the singular support, you have to consider the derived version of global sections? Because as far as I can see, there is also the standard sheaf of global sections, not the derived version also jumps, right? I mean, meaning just a zero instead of the whole R gamma? Yeah, rather than R gamma, just gamma. I mean, it's a naive question. Yeah. Um, I, I would say it's the, the way it was set up, at least historically, by Kashiwar and Shapira, it's, they work in the derived category. So what's, what's natural to consider is the derived functor of gamma. So in order to have functoriality properties. Um, so if, if you have a functor and, and you are to, you know, when, when you're in the derived category, you wanna wanna have things like um, like like a triangle of microlocal support. If I have a short exact sequence of sheaves, you're you wanna be able to say things like the singular support of the middle one has something to do with the singular support of the one on the right and the one on the left, say. So whenever you have a distinguished triangle in the derived category, you wanna be able to extract properties for that. Being in the derived category, what works just the way it's set up is is the derived functor of gamma, not not gamma itself, because that wouldn't see the higher cohomologies, which will not allow you to prove that property in general for those kinds of triangles. But let me point out, if you're in a situation, and sometimes we are, um, in which really you don't need the derived adjective and you can work with complex and vector spaces and everything, it's fine to just look on H zero. But um, I would say, just as a comment, the, the main reason why you need the derived categories, there's several of them, but one of them is you want it to be Legendre invariant. So when you perform a rhythm Meister one move and you ask, you know, here I had a vector space, maybe it was zero and C, and now it's zero C, what do I put in here? When you do a rhythm Meister move, one already, you realize you need complexes of sheaves and not just sheaves. It's not possible to have a vector space being the stock. You need a complex of vector spaces being the stock. So that's the first place where being Legendre invariant immediately tells you you cannot just get away with uh, vector spaces. Rather, you need to take a derived setting. Does that answer the question a bit? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, these days we even have enhanced that to the DG setting. So typically now we think about DG derive uh, instead of just derive, and that has also some advantages. All right, so yeah, let me let me just jump into that and and let you know that we're going to consider Legendrian link lambda again, unique tangent bundle of R two, and now a bit of a mouthful. We are going to consider the category C lambda to be the category of constructible sheaves on the plane. So again, we could take constructible sheaves on R2, and we ask them to have singular support on lambda. The asterisk here is for me to say, please experts uh, ask away if you want for the specification. But one thing I'll say is the category is not actually that category. It's the subcategory of compact objects. So if you know what it, it means to have a, a, a nomologically compact object, um, so preserving co-limits, uh, that's that's what we want. So really. C lambda is the subcategory of compact objects in the constructible sheaf category, which is a full DG subcategory. All right. So in particular, what you'll learn is that if you have a front in here, you get a sheaf which is constructible with respect to the front. So here again, the singular support is the key link capturing this idea of first derivatives that relates sheaves to Legendrians. All right. So the category of compact objects in in of C lambda, first important theorem, abbreviated JKS, uh, the, the G is Stefan Guillermo, the K is Masaki Kashiwara, and the S is Pierre Shapira, 2016, I think it's published in Duke. This category is a contact isotopy invariant. And actually their theorem is, is more beautiful than that, is there exists a convolution that you can perform for any Hamiltonian isotopy that gives you that precise uh, DG equivalence. So uh, there is a kernel that they build, very nice kernel, um, such that uh, it, it realizes that, that equivalence. So, but, but we just need to know that it's an invariant. And now 
one of the questions that we asked at the beginning, how do sheaves interact with each other? Can, can one sheaf have an arm with another? Sort of the, the, the rough homological answer is you take just our arm of sheaves. So you take the arm sheaf between them and then global sections. But I really want you to think that this is just merely generalizing intersections. So for instance, if you had a Legendrian flying in here, like in some way, and then some other Legendrian that, that did something like that, a sheaf which is supported here and a sheaf that is supported here, just not even micro support, just, just the support itself. If the stock of the purple is zero outside and the stock of this is zero outside, you're only gonna see interesting things in the intersection. Um, but actually when you do ARAM uh, in these cases, you're also gonna like keep in track a bit this micro local idea. So the singular support uh, is also important. But, but again, just generalizing intersections in that sense. All right, so fantastic. You have categories and you might feel good about yourself. I can say so many things about a category. Well, maybe some people can. Myself, I am more comfortable with a thing like a manifold or an algebraic variety more than you know a category. Luckily for us, um, the work of Bertrand Toen and Michel Vaquier explains how it's possible to extract a model I of objects from that category. So I've always tried to keep it in blue and it's depicted M lambda, math track M of lambda. Their precise statement is uh, that there is what's called a D minus stack of pseudo perfect objects in that category. And the word geometric here uh, literally means that it's locally a finite presentation and locally geometric. Um, for somebody who likes algebraic varieties like myself, that is a lot. That is, you know, a very general notion of space. Um, but actually, in many cases, including Legendrian links in T star of R2, um, a lot of times this just ends up being an algebraic variety, at most what's called an Artin stack, which in these cases, you can just think of it as being an algebraic variety, model O, a nice algebraic Lie group action, like GLN, PGLN. So the lesson here is out of that category, in our examples, you're gonna be able to extract something which is an algebraic variety, and then maybe quotient some action of GLN, something like that. So a space that I myself feel a bit more brave about computing things like cohomology, maybe the Hodge structure, saying something about curves inside of it. I don't know, I, I just, it's, it's, it's just better for the way I think about things. So that's what I'm going to focus on, that geometric object, which is, you know, this mouthful. It's the model I have sort of perfect objects in that category, which is an, which is an invariant by virtue of, of lambda being an invariant. All right, a down-to-earth example. So suppose I take this front. This actually is, is the trifoil. It's the front we described before. And now you ask the question, uh, what, what does this model I look like? Well, the model of the whole category can be discretized by something called the microlocal rank, which is by how much you jump when you go from one open strata to the next one. And we're gonna restrict in this talk for this microlocal jump to be of rank one, which is a simple thing. If you thought about model A spaces of things like Higgs bundles or curves, you know, fixing the genus is a way to discretize and, and take one component, fixing the degree of the line bundle, um, that's another way. So here we just fix the microlocal rank. So that's that's not a very sort of deep restriction. You were setting one of the basic components in there. So what does this translate to in this example? Um, in this case, you can just take vector spaces, CCC. So those Cs are forced because I have zero and then I have jump by dimension one. So this better be Cs. Now I have to jump by dimension one when I go here. That forces this C2. And now I have to jump by dimension either one or minus one. And in order to have zero outside, I better have a C here. So that determines the stocks over there. The stocks in the other lower strata can be defined from those. And the fact that you want this to be the microlocal support and not the whole cone in here tells you that you're going to have some restrictions in these restriction maps. And the restrictions are, and I translated it here in a formula like that, that this map, which is a vector in C2, a vector in C2, a vector in C2, a vector in C2, and here if you take the kernel of this, it's a vector in C2. So I have five vectors in C2, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5. 
you want those vectors, if they're consecutive, if they differ by a crossing, to have determinant one, one with the next one. So that's what it is. It's five tuples of vectors such that vi is transverse to vi plus one. You can actually ask that determinant to be one. And then there's the action of PGL to C on the whole C2 in the middle. And that that is the space. That is, is the space. Uh, sorry, I, I, lost, I lost you. So, yeah. so, so what is this determinant so, uh, condition? And actually, I mean, it would be nice if you slightly elaborate. So geometric model space of objects. So, so each word I probably understand, but I don't understand the sentence. So, 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 so I yes. kind of lost you at item two, and completely at item three. Okay, so, let's so. let's go back to two then. Is that is that, is mm -hmm. that good? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, okay. let's let's start here. Um, so, um, this is a this is a this is a DG category. It's a, some category. So. What you can do out of this category is to construct, so you can construct uh, what's called a D minus stack. So what, what this is, is a functor, which is, is, is trying to represent the functor of points of something, which goes from uh, like, like what you input. So um, in this case, it would be, so if you were if we were doing scheme theory, you would just say, I have a K algebra and I output the set of points. So if the K algebra is like R, then in here, I would just output the set of R points in my algebraic variety, a set of complex points, a set of real points, a set of rational points, so on and so forth. So you would go from K algebras to, uh, to sets. Are we comfortable with this uh, viewpoint of, so that will be on from your given, uh, if it's represented by something, it would be on from your given. Uh, so that's our points, it's maps to be to R, right? So th does this make sense? Um, just this sentence, a, a scheme is something that can be thought through its functor of points as a functor like that. Well, okay, go ahead. Maybe, maybe at the end it will, yeah. Okay. Also. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. Yes, sir. So there's this a question in the chat. I mean, it says, what happens in, if instead of C2, you take C3? Well, that's about the microlocal rank. So you could instead make the, the rank jump by two. So then you would have zero C2 and C4 in the middle. And then what you would have is five two planes in C4. So those are five points in the Grismanian 2, 4, uh, such that they're transverse consecutively. And that's an interesting incidence problem, and you can study that. It's slightly harder, but it's still accessible. It's just another component of the model. I. Um, yeah. So, so just going back to, to Lenin's question, just to say, what, when I have an algebraic variety, such, such as, as you know, if you just take spec A, um, there is a functor of points. Now, in our cases, you have to care about the endomorphisms of objects. Uh, so some of these points are going to have an action. So these this P sets get substituted by something. Uh, and this something is, is simplicial sets. And maybe what's more important about this is that you can just think of that now as being a topological space. And the topology of that space captures for you things like, did that object have a big endomorphism algebra? So that's sort of kind of classic, coming from the classical theory of model I spaces where some objects, like the model I of elliptic curves, some elliptic curves have more automorphisms than others. So that's what's capturing for you. And the other part of the stack is that instead of just inputting complex points and real points, you're allowed to input more, more stuff. And that's that's called simplicial K algebras. So the, the, the way you build the stack is exactly the same. Is given a simplicial K algebra, if you have an object T, you can consider these ohms in, in that category over there. So that is a functor. So out of this out of this category, you get a functor. And then the question is, is this functor representable? Is this functor of the sort om A of R? If it is, then you can think of that functor as being the functor of points, in this case of an affine scheme. 
So, uh, so can, can one say that you are trying to, to get some structure on the set of all shifts with uh, singular support in lambda? Correct. You, you, yeah, so th that set defines a functor, and you can ask, is this functor, so is this, so is a functor that, for instance, given the complex numbers, it gives you some set, actually a topological space. Out of the real numbers, it gives you that. And then you can ask, this kind of assignment, does it come from, say, an algebraic variety? Is, is, it, is there an algebraic variety such that when I ask what are the complex numbers, that's exactly what the output of the functor okay, is? Okay, very good. So let's go to the next item with these determinants. Okay. Yeah, right. And yeah, and the word geometric is saying kind of less. It, it mm -hmm. kind of comes from an algebraic variety. Right. So yeah, so for that, uh, we need we need to take a step back then for the determinant. So when you have a front, um, let's let's take here here's a front. So this is the, the, the same front twice at a crossing. So I, I I zoom near here, and now suppose that the stocks of my sheaf are zero c c two. And C. That's just given by the microlocal rank one condition that the jump of these arrows need to be one. So here's what would happen if I just said, let's consider a sheaf in R2 such that it has these stocks and then no condition whatsoever. So for instance, this map from C to C2 could be a certain vector, the image could be a certain vector. And suppose that this other vector is also the same one. Well, that's a perfectly allowed sheaf. It's a fine sheaf. Sorry, not, not fine in a technical term. It's, a, it's, a, it's an allowable sheaf in R2. It's constructible with this stratification, but what's the issue with it? What, what goes wrong? What goes wrong is that such a sheaf is not going to have singular support in the Legendrian. Rather, it's going to have singular support in this point, pointing out in directions which are not on the front. So you see, you really want the singular support to be this point and exactly the orthogonal, this point and exactly the orthogonal, this point and the orthogonal, this point. So in particular, the crossing, you only allow the singular support to go that way if you're coming from one branch or the other way. But you really don't want the whole cone here in the middle to be directions in which your sheaf might change. So there is some condition that's going to come from computing telling you that the singular support really is only allowed to be this direction or that direction if you are at the crossing. So now you sit down and you compute that condition. And what you end up finding is that the condition is that this map and this map must have transverse images. So this vector and this vector in C2, the images of these two maps must be transverse to each other, must, must not be parallel. So that's the condition you get by imposing that the singular support really is restricted to line lambda and not that cone in the middle. Does it make sense so far? Yes, thank you. So once you know they're not parallel, this is part of the asterisk in here. Once you know they're not parallel, um, you can try to make that be even more explicit by asking that the determinant is one. Um, and, and that's where the determinant condition comes. It, it truly is a question about not being parallel. And by putting some frames and some bases and asking for some conditions, that does translate in determinant being non-zero. And then you can even ask for determinant one without losing anything. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. So but is there for... any way to actually expand it to C3? That was my question, because you're dealing with like a set number of dimensions, almost a set number of crossings. So what happens if you go higher? Higher in the number of crossings? Like if I had here like a two n torus link or where is Yeah, more or here? less. What are the other options of trying to go into higher dimensions? Yeah, but what goes higher? The vector space or or the or m lambda? Both. Either one, you can answer both questions. Yeah. So, so yeah, if you add more more crossings in here, uh, then you're going to have, you know, the tuple of vectors is going to have as many as crossings you have in here plus one. Um, in fact, the hypersurface that you get in, in CN is uh, cut out by one equation that it's actually uh, the Euler continuum. 
it's one of Euler's continuums from like 1764. So if you go to his paper, which is written in Latin, you see that equation pop up, which is kind of a nice thing. So those model I spaces are cut out by nice equation, uh, nice uh, hypersurfaces. And that's one way to go up in dimension. And the other is to ask for the microlocal uh, rank to jump not by one, but by two. So then you would have zero C2. And then here you would have C2, C4. And then instead of having vectors in C2 with some transversality condition, you would have C2s inside of C4s. So that's a fine Grassmannian 2, 4, projected Grassmannian 1, 3s uh, with some transversality condition. Does that answer the question? I think it does. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Actually, can um, I ask one related question? Yeah, please. Uh, so where do the where does the jump condition come from? So when you have these, uh, the, the short answer is um, if I have the sheave around, say this kind of arc, mm -hmm. I can compare global sections here and then here, because yeah. this is a singular support. There's going to be a change. The cone of that which is measuring the difference, the cone of that restriction uh, functor, that is a non-trivial uh, vector space, complex in general. And sure. you can, when you study objects in this category, just ask what is the Euler characteristic, or in particular, if it's just one vector space, what is the dimension of that vector space? And fix that as a discrete set. Like that, that's a discrete data. And you can say, I'm going to look at those objects. I think uh, Kashiwara and Shapira call them pure, in this particular setting, they're simple objects and pure objects, but th those are exactly the ones that jump by by these everywhere. Um, what's really happening is that there's a functor constructed by Guillermo called the microlocal functor that goes from this category to uh, global sections of the Kashiwara Shapiro stack. And what you can ask is that once you trivialize global sections of the Kashiwara Shapiro stack, because there exists a simple object, those just become local systems. And then you can ask, what is the rank of the local system in use on Lambda? And asking that the microlocal rank is one is the same as asking that the local system on Lambda is just an abelian local system of rank one. Um, OK, thanks. Does that, does that help? Yeah. Yep. Um, so to summarize, these this incidence problems of vectors in C2 can actually, once you put bases, uh, and I, that's what I wrote down, uh, you can write it down as a, some nice uh, affine uh, hypersurface, nice polynomial. If you've ever seen the DGA for the trefoil, that, that is the same as the differentials in the DGA for the trefoil. Maybe that's your first hope that one can actually understand how floor theory and shift theory relate. It's just the same equation pops up in both sides. That's a start. All right. Uh, let me let me go on. Um, so let, let me let me state the main theorem. Um, the, the main theorem is we have this Legendrian, we have this uh, category. We now extract this modelized space, and now I want to I want to say something about it. Think of it as an algebraic variety in many cases. What can we say about it? So the the, the somewhat surprising thing is that the sentence is going to be it admits a quasi cluster A structure. And not just exi existence is new, but it's not just that it exists. We can actually build it explicitly. And that's extremely useful as, as well. Um, so you can look, for instance, at its coordinate ring of functions. That is, a, that is an algebra. You can multiply functions. You can, you can sum them up. Those are regular functions. And the, the, the main theorem is it's not any algebra. It's what's called a cluster algebra. Of course, it is now my duty uh, in the time remaining or at least try to, to give you a sense of what does it mean for it to be cluster algebra. It's something special. Not every algebra is a cluster algebra. What is this good for? So on and so forth. So very shortly, I'm going to try to get to the following points. What is the geometric intuition for this model I M lambda? Like, how does it pop up if you're not doing shifts, just studying geometry, simplified geometry? The answer is this model I is going to be parametrizing Lagrangian fillings in a precise sense that I would say. So if you have an embedded exact Lagrangian filling for your Legendrian, that's going to give you a, a, a chart, if you end up with a local system, a point in that model line. So that's really what's happening. I cared about Lagrangian fillings. I wanted to talk about the model line of Lagrangian fillings. That is kind of insane. It's like infinite dimensional Lagrangian's model of infinite dimensional Hamiltonian isotopies. What is a good model for it? M lambda is a good model. It's a nice algebra variety that does the job of model of Lagrangian fillings. 
Question number two, what does it mean for it to have a cluster al a structure or the coordinate ring of functions being a cluster algebra? The short answer is it has a special atlas. There is going to be a way of covering the algebraic variety up to could I mention to by some toric charts, by C star to, to some power, some open toric charts, and the transition functions are going to be particularly good. Um, so I need to delve on that. And finally, uh, why is it useful? So sometimes people say, wait, 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 what's the point of this? Well, I, I don't have a good answer except that it just happens to solve a lot of the problems that otherwise seem hard. I, you know, there's many problems I cared about. Uh, for instance, uh, I'll, I'll mention one in the next slide. Uh, without these, I wouldn't know how to go about them. With these, suddenly they sort of become very naturally accessible. Okay, let me give me uh, a couple of examples. So these, these, these results sort of gives you a bridge between this world of symplectic topology and this world of cluster algebras um, in the sense that you now can try to, to go either way. The first result uh, that I was particularly happy about uh, was the fact that in symplectic topology, you can ask the question, if I give you a Legendrian knot, just in R3, how many Lagrangian fillings are there up to Hamiltonian isotopy? So before, before that uh, article in 22, the answer was finite in all examples we know, and otherwise we don't know. Sorry, As by the happens, way, it would have helped in the beginning to say that you're constrained to symplectic topology, because that was my question with C3, because if you're in symplectic topology, you're by definition with even powers. Like that so, was my question. That's what I was asking. So just for the future, I think it would help to like when you're making presentation to like mention these things, save some time. So, so just to be clear, like uh, the, the stocks that are vector spaces in the sheaves and where the affine variety or the model I belongs, that, that has that, that is an algebraic world. That is algebraic geometry. That's sort of the other side of the mirror. Like the, the symplectic topology problem that we'll discuss, that will be discussed in the next slide. Uh, it's a problem about Legendrian knots in R3 or S3, and then Lagrangian fillings in the standard symplectic Derbeau four ball. So just to be clear, those C3s, those Cs have not to do with symplectic or contact topology. Your paper is on the archive, right? So I can look over that. Yeah, all, all the papers I'm mentioning are on the archive, yes. So okay. that, that paper over here, the, the paper, it's titled Infinite Lagrangian Feelings, that is a geometric paper. But how do you come? So it has two, two pieces. One is it constructs infinitely many candidates of Lagrangian feelings that could be in different Hamiltonian isotopy classes. But then you need a way to detect it. You need a way to argue that those are indeed different Hamiltonian isotopy classes. The cluster algebra structure immediately does that for you. So uh, suddenly having this cluster algebra perspective allowed for distinguishing many things, in particular infinite families. And, and sort of the, the interesting thing for me on that result is that it, it sort of changed the way to view Legendrian knots. And actually the answer is you should expect most Legendrian knots, if they have a feeling, to have infinitely many. So it's very rare for a Legendrian knot to have finitely many Lagrangian fillings. Very rare. Like if you take a positive braid, if the braid is like sort of long enough, you typically should expect infinitely many fillings. Which it, it was nice, but not only was nice, it, the cluster structures they, themselves. There's an AD classification of cluster structures due to Andre Zelavinsky and Sergey Fomin, and and that that sort of made me brave enough to state an ADE conjecture. So in the in the in the proceedings of the Viterbo 60 conference, there's a paper. Uh, I think it's called Lagrangian Skeleta and Plane Curve Singularities, where there's an AD conjecture for the classification of Lagrangian fillings, which if you think about it, nothing like that exists in the smooth world. If you ask in the smooth world, what disks are bound by the end knot? What, what, how many smooth isotopic classes of tori are bounded by a trefoil? Nobody knows. But suddenly now we have a guess when you add the adjective Lagrangian. And all of that is guided thanks to this cluster. So here's cluster structures trying to help you uh, understand symplectic topology, structure it a bit, improve stuff. And I, I want to say I was somewhat happy about this. Uh, I always feel bad when I use something from algebra to prove something geometric, because I feel geometry is not giving back. Uh, so actually, uh, I'm very happy to 
I think, the, I mean, this is on the archive, but I, I can announce to you that there is a conjecture in, in cluster algebra, it's purely sort of algebraic conjecture, about whether certain algebraic varieties, um, in this case, Richardson varieties, so these are these are coming from intersecting two sugar cells, um, so something to do with the flag manifolds being transverse. Uh, it was a conjecture by the, um, Bertrand Leclerc, uh, Bernard Leclerc, uh, that the ring of functions was a cluster algebra. It had all these good properties. Um, so good, good news. Answer, the conjecture is true, but not just that. The proof goes through symplectic topology. So here's how the proof works. Uh, the proof is, well, given this data of two permutations that determine the Schubert cells that determine the Richardson variety for you, I'm going to build for you a Legendre knot such that that modelized space that I was saying, modelized space of sheaf support in lambda, is exactly that guy. Now, if I have a symplectic way to build now cluster structures, that immediately gives the cluster structure here. And uh, that's that's how it went about. And uh, there's a lot of nice synergy now between these two communities. And uh, well, yeah, the correlates are stronger, whatnot. Uh, for instance, there's now a name workshop coming up in January uh, where half of the participants are uh, sort of context symplectic, Legendrian people, and the other are cluster algebra people. And uh, I mean, we've been talking a lot and even collaborating, uh, but but I don't know. That's it's always nice to see something like that. Uh, are there any questions at this stage about either the main result or ways you can apply it? All right, so I'm, I'm just going to move on. Um, okay, so now, so this is the end of sort of the overarching story of where we are right now, or where I think we are. Um, now we're going to go into more nitty gritty development. So let me start where I started when I didn't know any of these and started to think about it, which is, I just care about Legendrian links. Those are Legendrian links in either R3 or the unique tangent bundle. And I wanna study them. And one way to study them is study Lagrangian fillings. So here's a cartoon picture. You have Lambda, that's that's your Legendrian link in here. And this is the standard Darbu D4. So that's the cotangent bundle of R2 with a symplectic form exact. So the, the Deville being the primitive. And now you ask about, embedded exact Lagrangians that bound this lambda. Obviously, if you ask for embedded exact Lagrangians, which are closed in R4, uh, Gromov, and these days many other arguments tell you they cannot exist. But if you ask them to be asymptotic to this lambda, they do exist. And you can ask about their Hamiltonian isotopy classes. So namely, up to compactly supported Hamiltonian isotopy. And that's an interesting way to, for instance, distinguish Legendrians. Maybe some Legendrians do have Lagrangian fillings, some don't. Maybe some has five, the other has seven, and that tells them apart. Um, and it's overall, for my taste, a nice problem. Lagrangian surfaces in R4 asymptotic to a lambda classify Hamiltonian isotopy classes. That's the starting geometric point. So uh, like to, to, to the person who asked about symplectic topology, that is the symplectic topology input. That, that is the problem. So now, as I, as I said in, in, in more length, out of this, you can construct a Legendre invariant, the category of sheets with support on lambda, uh, small asterisk, microlocal rank one, and we add microlocal trivializations. And now we extract this model I lambda. Now, what is this lambda? This lambda, and this is made precise by the next statement, this lambda is, in a sense, the model I, or acts as a model I of Lagrangian fillings in the following sense. If I have a Lagrangian filling L, for lambda, then this automatically gives this chart. It gives a C star to the two, two times the genus of L inside M of lambda. So by a model, I typically people mean, well, every point parameterizes such an object. This, this is actually correct once you add local systems. So this C star chart really should be thought as H1 of L with coefficients on C star. Sorry by the bad writing. So, but H1 of L with coefficients on C star, that's ohms from H lower one to C star. So that's just C star representations of pi one. So that's just an abelian rank one local system. So another way to say it is a Lagrangian filling endowed with an abelian local system that gives you a point in this model I. Uh, if you're uh, familiar with floor theory, this is to be 
compared with the fact that in the Fukai category, oftentimes you need the notion of a local system for your objects. The Lagrangian just doesn't cut it, you need Lagrangians and local systems. Uh, some people call these brains. So this is the same business here. If you don't think about the local system, meaning you allow it to vary, then L gives you this chart, the historic open chart, and otherwise Lagrangian filling with an abelian local system gives you a point. Um, Right, so, so just one question. So, I, so should should I think of this as a local chart around fixed local system, as you say, and then I vary the components of it uh, across each of the generators? Yeah, except one? in your sentence, I would say around a fixed Lagrangian. Yeah, so so you really right. think about it as it's geometrically the same fixed Lagrangian for all these points in the chart, and the only thing that changes is the local system. Okay, so it's just a local chart around that fixed Lagrangian with a fixed local system. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the best way I think about it that way, and, and it works. Okay, so now, for instance, different Lagrangian fillings might give you different charts, and you can prove um, that if you give different charts, then the Hamiltonian algebra class is different. Actually, can I ask one quick question? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, if you have a Lagrangian filling of a Lagrangian link, then they should uh, give you an augmentation, right? How does R? Uh, how, how does R? Uh, Sigma know about augmentation of the checking of the DGA. So, sorry, is the question how does this get? What, what is the full theoretic explanation of that phenomenon? Uh, no, I mean like this wanderlust stack should know about uh, like uh, the sort of the augmentation induced on checking uh, on the not uh, uh, DGA, right? Well, I mean. Right. So if you're to be thinking for theoretically, you can associate to lambda the, the, the DGA, mm -hmm. and then you can consider augmentations of that DGA. And if you think about it, um, I think Echo on the Kalman in 2016 wrote a paper, I think it's in GEMS, that says that actually, if you have a Lagrangian filling L, the augmentation actually goes to the group ring of H1 of L. So that's right. Z with coefficients in H1 of L. But now H1 of L it's just it's just free, so that's the z. It's the group ring of z to the r, the integer. So that's a free z module. But mm -hmm. now the group ring of z is just Laurent polynomials. So th this is saying that the augmentation is actually into Laurent polynomials. When you take spec of that, that means you go from spec of Laurent polynomials into say a zero of the DGA, and spec of Laurent polynomials is precisely the toric chart. Uh, okay, thanks. Yeah, should say I, I started all this business doing the DGA and augmentations and everything because it's what I knew best, but it, it gets extremely complicated because of the A infinity. So some some sort of philosophical point for everybody. In in the chief world, you just get DG. The, the things are just, there's a differential, there's a product, and that's it. There's no A infinity business. In, in the Fukai world, the augmentation plus category, you always have this A infinity. You always have this up to homotopy you know, to make it associative or the next one. Even when you consider further structures like a Lee structure, there's an L infinity structure in the floor side, but this is just a, a DG Lee structure on the nose in the sheaf side. So there's something about the sheaves that just package much, much neater without the higher homotopies, which are of course interesting. But... Anyway, so you can do some of that for theoretically. Um, all right, so very succinctly, what is a cluster variety? Uh, what what makes it stand from a geometric viewpoint from from others? And I, I won't do an excellent job, but but at least a hint. So here's how here's an affine variety. Uh, that's how fine varieties look to me. So some topology, some asymptotic ends. So when you do smooth topology, you typically cover things by, by charts, which are open sets in CN or RN. So in the cluster world, what you ask is that you have an atlas whose charts are open charts of the form C star to the N. So that's, that's the statement that you have M up to co-dimension two being TS. Uh, the co-dimension two statement is due to a theorem in several complex analysis called the Hartog's theorem that says that the regular ring of functions will only see things up to co dimension two because homomorphic functions actually do extend um, to co dimension two. So it's a decomposition of your variety into open toric charts, C star to the D, algebraic tori. But furthermore, and this is really what's new, each tori comes with automatically a set of coordinates, a set of uh, 
I don't know who gives them to you, God given, math given to you, coordinates. And, and that's what an algebra, a cluster algebra is, is not only do they give you the torus, but they give you these this coordinate functions, which are special. How are they special? Number one, they're regular. They extend to the whole variety. Not only in that torus, they're, they're restrictions of regular functions. So the way I've written it, it's telling you that that is the case. And in fact, the torus is cut out by the non-vanishing locus of those regular functions. And furthermore, and that's the combinatorial aspect to um, cluster algebras. So if you, you know, Sergei Fomin does a lot of combinatorics, that's, that's sort of the combinatorial flavor to this. It's coming from the fact that when you take the functions that are given to you in the historic chart versus the ones that are given in the historic chart, the way the transition function works is given by some extremely precise combinatorial formula, which I'm not gonna describe, but all I want to say is it's to do with a combinatorial structure called a quiver. So it's a, a kind of directed graph. So given a directed graph in one of these charts, you exactly know, you determine how to transition to any of the other uh, neighboring charts. And um, what really- Sorry, could you actually write down like the formula for how you got to a quiver? Like, is it just a picture representation or did you like derive it somehow? So. In, in cluster algebra world, the quiver is just given to you. You don't know where it comes from at all. But can you like write it down? What do you mean it's given to you? No, no, like when, when somebody tells you, consider this algebra, this cluster algebra, they must tell you what the quiver is. Otherwise it's not enough data. Like what, I, what data I'm asking is what's the one you're using now? Like yeah, you yeah, have yeah, a yeah. board, can you write a mathematical expression for it? Well, so this is, is kind of the next sentence. So our job is number one, to find these functions in the symplectic world. What, what are they in the symplectic world? How, how do you canonically get these functions? And how do you get the quiver? And, and indeed uh, for a Lagrangian filling, the quiver, I can, I can write it here. The quiver is gonna be the intersection uh, quiver of a certain set of curves in your Lagrangian filling. So you take H1 of the Lagrangian filling, that is a lattice. It has an intersection form, a skew-symmetric one. You can then say the vertices of the quivers are given by certain elements in the basis, and the number of arrows is computing just the number of intersections. And we know a Lagrangian filling gives a toric chart, so that's a start. Your model I, we know, has these toric charts, but the, the real question being uh, faced here is, what are these coordinates A, A, S, J? Why do they satisfy that they have this special property? And yeah, as it's being guessed, in particular in the transition functions, it's included the information of how do you get the quiver here? So um, I'm gonna finish the talk with um, two quick things. So very quick one and then a picture. Um, the first is why would you care about these things being closer variety? As I said, you can solve problems, which is always good. But sort of more philosophically, um, when you know something is a cluster A variety, uh, things like the singular cohomology, even finer invariants in the case of algebraic uh, varieties like mixed Hodge structure, um, actually are much more computable combinatorially. So uh, a favorite example of mine is the 819 knot, which is the 3-4 torus knot. The 3-4 torus knot is kind of the first knot that is kind of interesting in general, not just the 2-n knot. Um, we didn't know the cohomology of the, the, the augmentation variety in floor theory. We didn't know the cohomology of the sheaf model I. Now that we know exactly how it looks like from a cluster perspective, it's just like, it's literally a minute to compute it. It's very simple. Um, and, and this is true actually for all torus knots. So now we know the cohomology of all these model I for all torus knots. If you are more arithmetically minded, you wanted to do like how, how many FQ point counts are there. There's formulas for it in cluster algebras. It's kind of combinatorial enough that you can say interesting things about. I'm going to skip this example uh, right now, and I'm just going to go to the general picture, and then you can ask any questions. So I'm going to I'm going to go through all of that. Uh, so it's fine. Don't read that. You don't have to. I can show the slides later. Let's let's finish here, okay? So I'm, I'm gonna give you the, the key ideas on, on why the theorem is true and, and how you go about proving it. So this is the picture. What do we have here? What we have is a Lagrangian filling, L, 
So that's L in here for you. L is your Lagrangian filling. That L gives you, remember, a toric chart. So that, that gives you these two times the genus of L, which is inside your modelized space, parameterizing the Lagrangian fillings with local systems. Now, what do you want? Well, to begin with, you want some other toric chart, which is not just this one. So now you want to go to another toric chart in here. So say another toric chart here for another L, GL prime. But you want those toric charts, and that's the first tricky thing, you want these toric charts to be related by these special transition functions. And you can ask then, oh, how do I start with a Lagrangian filling and get to another one in a somewhat natural way? And the answer to that, and I very much thank Linit for his 1991 paper uh, on Lagrange surgery. It's a paper that I read as a grad student and I keep reading from time to time. And uh, yeah, thanks for writing that. That's a fantastic paper. There's an operation called Polterovic surgery and in modern terms, it also goes by the name of Lagrangian disc surgery that does the following. It takes a Lagrangian filling and a curve in it, which is bounded by a Lagrangian disc on the complement. So this is the first new geometric setup. You don't just care about Lagrangian fillings, but now you care about Lagrangian disks in the four ball that have boundary in your Lagrangian filling. What you can do then very succinctly, and I can in the question time explain in more detail, you can shrink this disk and expand it in some other way. Um, the, the, again, the model for that is in, in Linnitz's paper in 91. And that will typically give you a Lagrangian filling, which is Lagrangian isotopic, but typically not Hamiltonian isotopic. So it's not exact Lagrangian isotopic. If you're familiar with things like Chekhanov and Clifford and going over that singular point in the left shift vibration, that's exactly what's happening. So you change the Hamiltonian isotopic class. You don't change the smooth class, for instance, or, or the Lagrange isotopic class. Now that Polterovic surgery, that Lagrangian this surgery, will be the one that really gives you the transition functions from one side to the other. So now question number two, what are the functions and, and then what is the quiver um, giving you this special cluster structure? And the answer is, is, is this thing that I have been calling an L-compressible system. So the idea is the following. The idea is you take your Lagrangian filling and then you try to find curves in it, as many curves as possible, such that the complement, that in the complement of the filling, they bound Lagrangian disks. One way to think about this in modern terms is you're trying to build a relative Lagrangian skeleton for the four ball relative to this lambda. So all this L has a lot of topology, but you wanna be killing it by adding these disks on the complement. And if you consider L union those disks, that would be a Lagrangian skeleton. So in general, the quiver is just going to be given by the intersection of the curves in the Lagrangian that bound those disks. Now you can ask how many such sets of curves exist, so on and so forth. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Sometimes some of them do, but they're not a basis in H1. But the last sentence I'll say is the special functions that cluster theory tell you you should really study and look at, that they're going to tell you a lot of properties, are microlocal allonomies along the Poincaré dual of those cycles. So in the best case scenario, the situation is you have a Lagrangian filling, you take a basis of H1, which is one cycles, such that each of them bounds a Lagrangian disk embedded on the complement. Then you take the Poincaré dual of that basis, you end up with cycles which are relative now. So this is this gamma one dual that I wrote in here. And then what you do is you compare, you do some parallel transport with the local system comparing the endpoints. That gives you a function that's explained in, in the papers. And that function is the one associated to this disk in there. Uh, I can share the slides. Uh, I, can, I can talk more about this if you want. Uh, for now, I'll just say really what's new from a geometric symplectic viewpoint is that now we really want to ask questions such as, do there exist Lagrangian disks on the complement, bounding curves on the Lagrangian filling? That seems a question that's not been explored much. It seems to be very interesting. It's certainly very useful. I've developed some methods called Legendrian weaves that allow you to find those disks. So you can find those in, in some cases. 
But in some other cases, I, I have no clue how to find them. Uh, and in general, just understand, understand what's possible and what's not. Uh, that seems to me an interesting geometric question. So thanks a lot. And I will welcome any questions for now. I'll just wrap it up. Uh, I think there's some final slide here somewhere. But uh, yeah, well, when my PDF wraps up, consider the talk wrapped up. There we go. Thank you. OK. Thanks a lot, Roger, for the absolutely beautiful talk. Um, so any questions? <laughs>